Episode 195 with Mark Bale from Farbank. This episode is brought to you by Revenue River. Revenue River is a Colorado-based digital technology and marketing agency helping companies in the outdoor industry execute their e-commerce and online efforts. As certified big commerce and Shopify partners and a Diamond HubSpot partner, they are well-equipped with the technical experience and expertise to solve any business problem. Whether you need help with website design, system integrations, online store management, or growth marketing, they will help you achieve your goals. Revenue River clientele also includes Sterling Rope, Deuter USA, Alps Outdoors, and the Outdoor Biz Podcast. When you're ready to compete and win online, contact the Revenue River team at revenueriver.co slash outdoorbiz. I believe achieving success in the outdoor biz is dependent upon embracing the outdoor lifestyle and learning from outdoor leaders that came before you. If you agree, then listen up for tips, advice, and hacks about growing or starting your career in the outdoor biz. My name is Rick Says. Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. We've relaunched our Patreon page for 2020 and would love your support. For less than the cost of a latte, you can show your love for the fantastic guests and interviews that have become part of the outdoor and adventure community over the past three years. Visit patreon.com slash the Outdoor Biz Podcast and give us a little sugar. On to the show. We're kicking off 2020 with all things fly fishing throughout January. Johnny LeCoque from Fish Pond kicks it off, followed by Mark Bale from Farbank, Tom Sadler from the Marine Fish Conservation Network, and we wrap up the month with Brian Cheney from Corkers. In this episode, Mark Bale and I talk about the fall IFTD fly fishing show, his experience with Sage and now Farbank, and the great brands they have in their quiver, and Mark shows a bit about wine pairing at a sales meeting dinner. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Well, good morning to you, Rick. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Sitting there waiting for the ferry, huh? Yeah, 705. Been doing it for 30 years, so I'm pretty used to it. <laughs> yep, I did it for a while over on Vashon. Uh, yeah, I know, I know you did. West yeah. Seattle, yeah, so I can relate. <laughs> it's foggy morning here in Seattle, but the boat usually is on time anyway. It runs pretty well, to tell you the truth. That's an amazing system they have up there. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, good. It, it really does. Uh, it It is it is amazing when you think of all the moving parts. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with how you got introduced to the outdoors. How'd that happen? You've been fishing since you were a kid? Yeah, I grew up in northern Michigan in a small town in uh, northern Michigan. And I should probably point out for any Michiganders who might be listening that it's the lower peninsula, not the upper peninsula. Mm, yep, that's a big differentiation and, there. Yeah, you need to do that. And <laughs> I grew up in a little town uh, called Big Rapids, not Grand Rapids. It's 50 <laughs> miles north of Grand Rapids. And frankly, the outdoors was out the front door out the back door out the side windows of the house and everywhere yeah. um the muskegon river flowed right through town and we lived about maybe three blocks from the muskegon river and as a kid that was one of my great classrooms and in fact i i think about it often still today at 68 um i think about growing up there uh-huh. and i think about um but what what really truly when I said classroom, uh, the Muskegon River was for me. It was a I spent a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time there doing various and sundry things. Cool. So that was really my introduction to the outdoors. Is that my a big? Was, sorry, is that a big river? How big is the river? I don't know anything uh, it, about it. it. It's it's a. I'd say up there, it's a medium sized river at best. It's, mm-hmm. it's not huge by any means. Um, it was sort of, I think when you, as a kid, you could get your arms around you, you know, it was dangerous enough that people drowned in it every mm, year. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't so big and brawling that you really had to be totally on your game. Um, right. and, and it had, you know, all the great species in it. It had bass and walleye and, oh, wow. and, carp and trout and, you know, learning how to catch those, but also just, uh, honestly, um, being along the river, it, it yeah, was, yeah. I think about it here, you know, however many years, 60 years later, and it was, it was a great, great classroom for Must me. It's been a great place to grow up. Yeah. Sounds beautiful. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sorry. I don't live there anymore, mostly because of the winters. Mm-hmm, um, I still, mm-hmm. still love Michigan and love the fact I grew up there, but, uh, having lived out here for 40 years now, well, more than I, I've thoroughly embraced the Pacific Northwest. It's beautiful up there, too. So you were mucking around in Michigan until you are about, I don't know, I'm going to say eight. For, and then you went to Farbank at eight years old? I mean, you've been there forever. How long have you, how long have you been there? Well, I've been at Farbank for, uh, I started officially in-house in, uh, I think, 1988 or 1989. Okay. I, I worked as a as a field rep a few years in advance of that. And got to know the players and certainly by then had a pretty good understanding of the industry. And then 
uh, one of the original two founders, uh, Bruce Kirshner, mm-hmm. uh, asked me to come in and be the sales manager. And that that happened in uh, uh, 1989, really about the time in, in a lot of ways that the industry was really beginning to coalesce and come together. The trade organization had started with its first show uh, a year before. That's the mm-hmm. only one I've missed. I think that was in uh, it was in Pennsylvania. Maybe. Oh, it was wow. Yeah. And. And and I missed that one. And other than that, I've been involved with everyone since. So, um, but yeah, that's the that's the short story on all of and that. And did you have any non fishing outdoor related jobs, or were you always in the fish, fly fishing industry? Really, business? basically, I'd moved to Seattle in the mid seventies, and and I finished school out here, and uh, then I worked around the fishing industry. Um, mm-hmm. Frankly, all of the that sort of ten year period. Um, I always like to tell the story of there's a little fly shop that you would know here in Seattle called Patrick's. Yep. And, uh, it's a legendary shop. I yep. think it was founded in the 1950s, uh, on what at that time was the way out of town. Um, <laughs> and of course the town has now grown to the point where you're in town right? and, and Patrick's is still there. And I took a part-time job there working with Faye Patrick, who had taken it over from her husband who had died, Roy Patrick. And I worked there, you know, really on a part-time basis. And that was sort of while I was finishing school at the UW and that, that's how that all came about. Gotcha. Very cool. And so you just worked your way on up. So you guys have built quite a quiver of brands there at Farbanks. Tell listeners a little bit about that if people don't know much about Farbank. Well, it was initially it was Sage and Sage started in, well, technically 1979, but really 1980 at Don Green and Bruce Kirshner. Don Green had a long pedigree in the, in the fishing rod business. And Bruce Kirshner came out of the K2 family, the ski company. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's, I forgot about that. That's right. Todd Vashon, so you would know that. And, and, um, you know, they started the company and I'm going to say 1980, that's the date we use. And, you know, it, it, it sort of, did what it did um, while the industry was, co- as they say, coalescing during the decade of the of the 1980s, and it grew. And eventually, you know, I got hired, and other people got hired, and moved facilities uh, from one place on Bainbridge, where we still are today, to the place where we are now. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, we kept percolating along, lived through the river runs through it, the growth <laughs> that was going on, and the nineties and, um, and we made an acquisition in the late eighties or eight, late nineties. I'm sorry. We bought Lamson, the real company mm-hmm. owned remember that? a few years. Yeah. Um, eventually sold that, um, I basically to its present ownership. Hmm. And, uh, and then around the year 2000, um, you know, we had hired, uh, a business development person who was Travis Campbell, who mm-hmm. became our president and our CEO. He was on the show a while back. Yeah. Yeah, up until fairly fairly recently, and uh, he uh, and well, we first acquired Reddington, so we were Sage. We then acquired Reddington in two thousand three. Then we acquired Rio in two thousand five, and here just a year, a little over a year ago, we acquired Flywater Travel. So um, we we've, we've put together a, I think, a very diversified portfolio. Yeah. Um, it, it's a not without its challenges running essentially three different brands um, with manufacturing and, Mm -hmm. you know, two different nodes in the U S and then sourced overseas in the case of Reddington. So it's a, for the fly fishing industry, it's a pretty complex little beast. You got a lot of balls in the air. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of balls in the air. And, and, you know, every day you wake up, there's challenges, (laughs) tariff being the, the newest one in the Reddington world. And, and uh, I'll just uh, I'll offer as an opinion to any listeners, anybody who thinks that tariffs aren't having an impact on American business, right. you only need to call me and I'll run you through it. Yeah, call any small <laughs> business owner. Exactly. We're going through that here in Bishop, yeah, a little small business that I work for. Yeah, it's yeah. it's crazy. Um, what What's the, the Fly Travel brand that you just acquired? Fly, Flywater Travel. Flywater uh, Travel. What's that? I don't know about that. Well, there a, a recent acquisition that we made in July last year. Last year, it's a really cool little business based in Ashland, Oregon. Oh, cool. And uh, it's, uh, two people who've been in the business, Brian Gies, Kenny Morris, have been around it a long, 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 long time. Mm-hmm. Um, great industry hands. Um, really, really a cool staff of people. Uh, it's it's a wonderful little business and a nice little um, addition 
And they do to, trips, uh, for, flight trip, travel, for, obviously. Yeah, that's what they do. It, cool. It's, you know, if you're familiar, obviously, with Frontiers or Yellow yeah, Dog, right. or yeah. any of the other travel companies in the fly fishing space, Flywater Travel would be very much in that space. Um, and and it's been a, frankly, it's been a wonderful uh, acquisition for us. It gets us into a different sort of arena. We're not dealing with physical inventory. Right. We're dealing with experiences. And since that seems to be the way the world is going, um, and we're very, very, very thrilled to have made that uh, acquisition. And yeah, we'll be that's... working with the people there. They're, they're great people. Ashland's a cool, cool town. Mm-hmm. Easy trip from, you know, Seattle straight yeah. down the coast, a little yeah. over an hour flight, you know. So there's a lot of neat things about it. Yeah, very and, cool. In a similar way that Rio was a great acquisition, and so was Reddington. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you guys have a great quiver. It's it's a good collection. It's good diversity. You know, it's I admire that. You put together a nice little package there uh, i was talking to one of your reps the other day and he suggested i ask about some of the wine pairing dinners you guys have had with the sales team <laughs> he said there have been some memorable ones and wanted to know if any particular one stands out as a favorite for you he's got one but he didn't tell me it <laughs> well I, I i suspect you, they know who you were you, talking you can imagine who asked the question yeah, yeah, but and maybe more importantly i can i can guess who you weren't talking to <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> because right. uh, there are there are definitely going to be uh, reps in the organization who really don't care all that much about <laughs> one um well, you know, you you've been around Washington. You've watched it. I mean, from the time I moved here, we 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 now have it was about zero wineries, and we now have eight hundred fifty named wineries. Oh yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it it is crazy. Just walk through any supermarket in the Seattle area, and yeah. you will be boggled. By My sister choice. has a second home down in um, Oregon, McMinnville, Oregon, and it's just oh, like yeah. yeah, that used to be countryside, nothing. No, now it's no like, kidding. Holy cow! Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they also have a great uh, gin distillery down there called Ransom. I think oh, I'll have to there. check that but out. I that, didn't know that. That's another. That's another uh, alcoholic uh, beverage <laughs> going through a revolution. But to your question, um, I'm a big fan of a winery in Eastern Washington that's called Woodward Canyon. It's one of the oldest over there, and uh, we had a very memorable sales meeting where um, a combination of of Woodward Canyon and then uh, Dennis Cake Bread from California. Mm. Um, you know, the Cake Bread Winery, yep. again, mm-hmm. one of the older names in the Sonoma area. And he kindly uh, fronted us uh, uh, a few cases and Woodward Canyon comped us a few cases. And um, nice. as one who has done 30 different sales meetings over the years, that was one of the more memorable sales meetings and pairings yeah. of wine. <laughs> Perfect. Good, good. I, it, I, said, I said very quickly, Ed, we don't oftentimes pair wine at sales meeting dinners. It's not. You not know, yeah, exactly. Dinner. I was going to say, yeah, we, we've done that a few times at sales meetings I've been at. And it's like, yeah, you don't do that every year. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen every year. I will add that as far as memorable sales meeting dinners goes, we, we uh, our ownership that has started a uh, build a lodge in Montana in the Paradise Valley, which is called the Sage Lodge. Oh, cool. And uh, we had our sales meeting there uh, last year. We were the first official group in the hotel, and it, mm. it really is probably more of a hotel than a lodge. Um, and that was quite memorable, right at the base of Immigrant Peak, oh, right wow. on the banks of the Yellowstone. Um, beautiful A-frame lodge structure that frames the mountain. It, it was you know, I've done a lot of cool ones over the years. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. was really one of the most memorable. Good for you. Sounds beautiful. And you guys will go back there regularly, I would assume. Well, I, we, we'll, we'll figure out a way to get back there eventually. We won't go every year, mm-hmm. um, but it was for a one-time deal to go to Montana and yeah. be the first people in the lodge. Um, it was really a special event. Very cool. So we're just back from the IFTD show. What's your perspective on the state of the fly fishing biz these days? Well, the IFTD show, uh, I'll almost divorce from the rest of the industry, which may yeah. sound a bit strange, but uh, it was going to be a good event from the beginning. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the APTA board had broken away from the ICAST organization, and we'd been in, teamed up with, with them in Orlando for a number of years. And so this was kind of like a, uh, I was kind of like a family reunion in a way to go back to Denver, mm-hmm. back to the mm-hmm. convention center. Um, at a time of year that was very amenable to a lot of the dealers in the Rockies in particular. Um, and so, you know, it really was a nice sort of recoming out party and it had that feel to it. it. Did, the, show yeah. was, the show was busy, plenty, plenty busy. And, 
got to see a lot of old faces that maybe you'd stop seeing come to Orlando. Mm. Um, you know, and so if you're just looking at a vibe, it would be hard to beat what you saw in Denver. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, that was, that was quite cool and nice to do. And frankly, you know, it is a pretty personable, uh, industry and to be able to get time with people that maybe you haven't seen for quite a while. And then that's not without value, both on a personal level and a business level. Yeah. It's, it's, it reminds me of OR. It's, uh, it's very much like a yeah. high school reunion, you know, you get yeah. together with people and hugs and back slapping and have a couple of beers. And, 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 you know, Rick, that's the good and that's the bad of it. It's a lot like <laughs> yeah. a high school reunion and yeah, it's a lot like a high school reunion. And, <laughs> and so, um, and, and not a lot of business gets done other than, you know, catching up with people or talking to people who have specific issues or questions or concerns that they want to bring up with you. But, you know, my metric on the show is the number of dealers mm -hmm, that we mm -hmm. sat down and met with, or that were actually dealers of ours that we saw in the overall count. Um, and, you know, I, I, I know this isn't what the after board wants to hear, but um, we'd been down to about somewhere between 50 and 65 dealers in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And then this year in Denver, the actual count of dealers, our dealers there was about 85. Wow. And, you know, so it had gone up, but it hadn't gone up to 200 yeah. or 300, you know? Sure. And so, you know, that's always the rub. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. I guess I'll say the other rub is, is that having run the marketing and in a previous lifetime, um, for Sage, you know, I get to see what you write, what the checks are. You write to go there. <laughs> what do you have? What the expenses to be there? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do that anymore, and I'm glad I don't. But you because know, <laughs> uh, I'm on just the sales side, that's all in the marketing world. But it, but I understand the pain. It, mm -hmm, it, it's mm -hmm. expensive to go there. So yeah. anyway, I think the real metric on it will be what happens in year two and in year three, because it'll be back in Denver next year again yeah. in October and. And, you know, it, it will be, my hat will go off to AFTA if they can get more dealers to come next October than they got this year. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of these shows are struggling from that. It's a combination of timing. It's a combination of expense for the retailer trying to get away from the shop. You know, these guys are all small stores. So when they yeah. leave, they kind of have oh. to close the doors. So it's, yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. It, 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 it's, it's very material. And, mm -hmm. and again, I think of, I mean, I'll just talk about it from a timing point of view. All of our preseason orders were written uh, by October 15th, right, yeah, and right. that's the day the show started, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, you know, it's a little bit of like we've seen everything. We don't even need we, – we hardly took anything other than a little bit of new product. That isn't to say we didn't have plenty of stuff in the booth. Sure. Mm -hmm. A far cry from what we used to do. So, look, I, I've – I've been around it, like I said earlier, since 1989. It continues to evolve. Yep, um, yep. I think it, there's a need for a trade show. Um, what it should be, when it should be, uh, those those are going to be debated uh, long after I'm gone from this industry. Oh, yeah, it'll continue to, to move and change and morph into forever. other things. Yeah, forever. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so fly fishing retailers seem to be under the same pressure retailers everywhere are, you know, e-commerce mm -hmm. and whatnot. How are, they, how are they responding? How are they, you know? weathering the storm, well, I so would to speak. Say that, you know, it kind of breaks out into there's a group about a third that would go to bed at night and wish they'd wake up. And it was 1992, <laughs> um, you know, another movie and, coming and out <laughs> and I don't, yeah, right. And I don't say that cynically. I just say that sure, there, there's, yeah. there's kind of a group that are, um, a little bit frozen in time. And then there's a group about a third that I think are really genuinely trying to figure out where they're going to take their business. And the big why in the road is, is whether you, do you just focus on the customer walking through the door or do you try to focus on the customer walking through the door and the customer who's online? Right. Um, you know, and, and then the other third are probably the group who've embraced the online experience and are having a greater or lesser success with it. They're finding out it's expensive. It's yeah. difficult. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a lot of things that maybe just taking care of customers walking in the front door uh, aren't, you know. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting time, as it always is, in, in the specialty world. Um, I, I think that what I see out there, the people that are, if you will, really winning at it are those who've either thrown their lot in. I'm not going to pay too much attention to the internet 
but I am going to absolutely worship anybody who comes in the front door and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure they have a great experience. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of that is the, is, is the online crowd who's doing their best to stay up with it Mm -hmm. and, and stay in, stay in front of it, spend the money where they know they need to um, provide again, a great level of customer service to the person who's getting into their world via an electronic portal of whatever sort. So Mm -hmm. That, that's kind of the the broad thing. I I think the underlying thing in it all, Rick, that I that I would observe is is that I spent the decade of the '90s and the first ten years of 2000s of the 2000s with uh, the, con- the 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 dealers really had a lot of control over um, their <laughs> consumer. Yeah, they don't have that control anymore. Yeah, it, it's just not there. That control is. I like to say the joystick is in the hand of the consumer and mm-hmm. that joystick can be in the bedroom, the bathroom, the dining room, the car, wherever your phone is, you yeah, know? Right. So yeah. that's the big change in the world as I see it. Well, and I think the good news for everybody is that the activity is still well embraced. And, you know, I mean, I, I live here in Bishop, California, we have a bunch of great fishing and it's, there are always people on the stream, you know, newbies and veterans alike. It's great to see. I always say that, you know, that, I mean, I love this business. I love this sport and I love the people in it. And I, I, I really do say as far as the sport goes, that the sport is as good as it's ever been. Mm-hmm. And, and that's coming from somebody who's frankly fly fished with, you know, since I was two or three or four years old, um, right. the picture I keep on my desk of me in a pair of diapers with a bamboo fly rod in my <laughs> hand, of course, that's totally staged by my parents, but, you know, indicative of how young it was when I began, but it's still an awfully good thing to do. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's relaxing and entertaining and challenging all at the same time. Do you get out and yeah. fish much still? Well, yes, I do. Um, I'm fortunate that I live in Bellevue. I have a, mm. you know, I can be on the Yakima, the headwaters of the Yakima over the mountains. That's about a 70 mile drive. I'm there in an hour and a half, and I can go over there, and I do fairly frequently. I also, with as much as I travel, I do try hard to make sure that I'm not going to get to the end of my career and say, you know, I was in X, Y, Z and I could have been A, B, C and I didn't. Yeah, good for you. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good about trying to get out and, and do it. And I also like, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama's dictum to do something new every year. I try to go to a new place and fish somewhere I've never been before. Oh, very cool. So, and, and, you know, that's one of the interesting things about the Flywater Travel Acquisition is you become pretty, pretty aware quickly that while we hear constantly the world is shrinking Mm -hmm. we also hear constantly how much more we know about the world that we didn't know right and and so there are places believe me there are plenty of places no so many places yeah yeah, i mean it's yeah it's 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 truly 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 unbelievable and and the ones that interest me the most are the ones that i can drive to (laughs) oh it's yeah no that makes sense yeah so you get there on a weekend no that makes total sense I try to be a little more aware of my carbon footprint right. and, you know, and, and as much as I'm on planes anyway, mm-hmm. um, I, I try to be, you know, where can I go locally that I haven't been before? And, you know, Puget Sound is a great example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of places to go right here in Puget Sound. Yeah. A lot of opportunities up there. It's a, it's a beautiful yep. spot. Um, so any new initiatives you guys are working on that you can talk about or you want to tell listeners about well, I, that are coming I, out? You know, I, we don't have any deep, dark secrets. We're always bringing out a new product cycle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, people who know us well can almost game us on <laughs> what's coming. You know, um, that's sort of the way the game gets played. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe the biggest thing we're doing is is something that wouldn't be of great interest to any of our, of our listeners or your listeners. And that's that we're, we're, we're moving away from Oracle and into Microsoft. <laughs> Well, there might be a few people out there that are interested in it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the episode for the guy that dropped this week is all about that uh, tech stuff. Yeah, e-commerce yeah, well, and SEO and you know language yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, well, believe me, there's when you go through a major you know new ERP system, uh, oh, I it's can imagine a, it's like a DNA transplant. And we're <laughs> we're in, both in terms of what you spend and what you put your organization through, but we felt it was time to do that, and so. We're, we're well into that and we're trying to hit a, you know, early 2020 deadline. So that's probably our, our, our biggest initiative, yeah, but we certainly have, we certainly have plenty going on all the product fronts. 
um, with the three brands with Rio Reddington and Sage. And, and then of course we continue to try to look at ways to integrate fly water travel into us and us into fly water travel. Yeah. And that, that's got everybody, well, not everybody, but plenty of us are busy on that. Mm-hmm. That sounds pretty exciting too. That'd be a fun it project is. to work on. I'll bet. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, what other outdoor activities do you participate in? You get out and hike much or ski? Well, or? Um, I'm a, no, I don't ski. Thank God. I grew up in Michigan. It was one thing I didn't do. <laughs> um, I yeah. had a basketball coach who said, if you're going to play basketball, you're not going to ski. Smart um, coach. Smart coach. Yeah. And, and so I never did, but, um, I'm a, I'm a pretty passionate gardener. Uh, okay. Rick, I, I've grown heirloom tomatoes for the last nearly 40 years wow. and I keep, keep working that system. And I live on an acre and a half that is I guess in some places you could glorify it and call it garden, a garden flower or otherwise. And, and, and that takes up a fair amount of time. I also enjoy the arts community a lot of which there's so much to do in Seattle or wherever I might be globally. So yeah, uh, those things keep me pretty well occupied. I have a, uh, yeah, 25 year old daughter who's in med school and, mm. you know, and then my wife and I enjoy doing whatever we can do with the time we have left. Very cool. That sounds fun. Yeah. Gardening is yeah. a great activity. I was talking to Johnny LeCoke last night and he was talking about his, all the time he spends outdoors, mostly on his property, just doing stuff. It's, yeah. Yeah. There's an great. interesting man for sure. John LeCoke. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorites in the industry. Yeah. Good guy. Uh, so do you have any suggestions or advice for folks either wanting to get into the outdoor industry or maybe if they're already in to grow their career? Well, um, I do because, you know, we, we're constantly hiring. We're constantly seeing a, a coming and going of employees. Um, it's a very dynamic labor pool and mark labor market right now, as you would know. And, mm-hmm. um, so we see a lot of new people coming in. We're constantly going through interview processes. Uh, you know, it's, it certainly was always easy to say, be passionate about the sport or the industry or the outdoors. And right. I think that's still baseline. But I would also say that if that's all you are, your chances of getting very far in most organizations, unless they're really, really small, are not great. With the amount of data that we have to process now, and the, mm-hmm. essentially, I'm not telling everybody you need to go get an MBA. No, yeah. Um, by any means, but you'd better be pretty computer literate. You'd better be pretty, pretty good with Excel and word. You'd better be pretty good with, if you will, spreadsheets, you mm-hmm. better be pretty mm-hmm. good with pivot tables. You you really better be able to look at data. And, and again, that's somewhat of a cliche, but it might not be for people who are uh, interested in getting in the outdoor world mm. uh, because you, you do need to have that sort of layer of skills that maybe my generation you know, 20, 30 years ago coming up, didn't have to have. Right. We struggle with that. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Cause I think there's a lot of opportunity for folks that have those skills and are passionate about the outdoors than, than there were before. Right. And it used to be that it was all about your passion for the outdoors. Now, if you're a tech wonk and you can do all kinds of crazy analytics and help us understand this, that, and the other, come on in, you know? Yeah. And, and, and by the way, if you know something in our case about fly fishing right, and, particularly if you really know something about fly fishing, you know, you're going to stand out uh, hugely, but if you just come in and, um, and, and, you know, you've been a great guide somewhere or you've worked in a great shop somewhere and you don't have the technical chops to go along with it, 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 it's going to really, I'm not going to say it's going to preclude you, but it's going to definitely, um, it's definitely going to get in your way if you want to climb up in an organization of any size. Yeah. Yeah. I would echo that. Yeah. Do you have any daily routines you use to keep your sanity? <laughs> Sitting on the ferry? <laughs> uh, well, I, I uh, would normally, if I weren't talking with you right now, I would be walking around the uh, holding lot here on the <laughs> Washington State Ferries to get about 3,000 of my 10,000 daily steps in. There you go. <laughs> I do walk on the ferry. I do. I, you know, if you own a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or any of those things, I think you're you're, you, you've got a trainer on your wrist yeah. and, and they, they do help you do things. But, but I do find that, that trying to stay, you know, onto that 10,000 steps a day is really a pretty good deal. Um, I, I wish I worked out more than I do, but I always seem to have a reason not to. And, oh, yeah. you know, I still am, yeah, I'm, on a, I'm in airports a lot. I'm flying a fair amount and I, I've never been able, I'm just one of those people. I was a 
pretty good athlete in high school, but it hasn't necessarily translated to adult life. <laughs> yeah, I've I've struggled with that workout thing too. All that I just the whole time I've been traveling, I just couldn't can't do it on the road. But you know, I can do a consistent routine at home. But I get on the road, it all falls apart. Well, one of our reps is a is a former professional tennis player, and I oh, admire yeah. him, I admire him greatly because you know he manages through thick and thin, but. It's a discipline that probably comes with having been a professional tennis player, which yeah, is you're my right. Excuse. It's a so, habit. Yeah, it's a habit. <laughs> it's a habit, yeah. How about some uh, favorite books or books you give as gifts or favorite podcasts? Any of those kind of things you want to share with the listeners? Well, I uh, I uh, fairly frequently give out a copy of Zorba the Greek to friends oh. or people that I meet. Um, I, uh, I've spent a fair amount of time in Europe and quite a bit of time in in Greece and Crete. And I'm a fan of Nick Nikos Kazantzakis, who is the author, but I'm really a fan of that book. I don't necessarily call it a wisdom book or a life book, but as a book where I, I find myself thinking about it and, and uh, referring to it once in a while, I, I would probably point people in that direction. Yeah, we'll um, link to that in the show notes. I'll have to pick that up. I never thought of getting that. That's a good one. the Greek. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. Yeah. I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan of Samuel Beckett. I'd recommend anybody that is near it go see a production of Waiting for Godot. And um, the other thing I think I would recommend is if I'm somewhere in the world and it's a Sunday and there's an art gallery with an exhibition of paintings, um, I don't think I do anything that takes me more out of me than going and looking at a half a dozen great paintings or even maybe not so great paintings. I, I recommend yeah. those activities, but I think maybe the thing I recommend most, at least what works best for me is get outside, get away from your computer, get away from your phone. Um, yeah, even if it's a walk around the lake, you know, <laughs> yeah. Walk around the building. I do that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's truly. Good. Yeah. Um, and how about a favorite outdoor gear purchase under a hundred dollars? <laughs> <laughs> Here's well, a chance for a shameless plug. What do you guys got? No, it, it's it wouldn't be something. It, it's a pair of uh, it's a hair, pair of binoculars. That oh, I you know what? You're the second person that said that. I think Johnny I said that it. last night. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Really? Well, I'll we'll have to call him up and we'll share reasons why. But I bought a very cheap pair of Bushnell binoculars. Uh huh. That I, I bought them. I think back in the '70s. They're a little sort of handheld, tiny pair, and I've. I've kept, it's one of those pieces of gear and I have about maybe four or five others that I've, I've taken, you know, a lot of different places have tried to lose, <laughs> um, and have maybe even had to go back and reclaim, um, here and there. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just, I use them all the time. In fact, I have them here on the, in the car with me this morning, they're old and crusty and I use them to spot birds or yeah. maybe orchids if we're lucky out here on the sound. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I didn't think about that until Johnny mentioned it, but that's a really good one because you, it's, well, you can it's take a, it anywhere and see all kinds of cool things. Yeah, and I like thoroughbred horse racing, and they've mm. been to a lot of different tracks around the world with me too. So you know, that would be that would be mine. And I think at the time, of course, now with if you inflate the dollars over the years, they'd probably right. be more than $100. But I think at the time they might have been $39, and I felt like I was getting ripped off spending that much for them. You know? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> no, that's a good one. Um, I got one other, which is a very small little nestling uh, group of cups that okay. put like a half a shot in. They nestle together, and uh, they're pretty common in the U.K. You see them in Scotland a lot. You pour yourself a little... Uh, let's call it eye wash. A little weed dram. Yeah, <laughs> the weed dram in the morning before you hit the water. And, uh, you know, I, I've carried those with me. And those you can still buy for, for not a lot of money. That's a good one. Yeah, well, we'll link to both of those in the show notes, too. Those are great. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to ask of our listeners or say to our listeners? Well, I guess what I, you know, I'd like to leave everybody with is, is that, you know, obviously the outdoors is is going to be challenging going forward into the next, let's call it 30 years, the mm -hmm. length of my career or a little more. I think there's going to be all sorts of issues that we confront, quality of fisheries, global warming, you know, those would yep. come to mind. And maybe just a shift in demographics. Um, I would still say wholeheartedly, as I do to anybody who asks, it's a it's a good place to try to have a career. Um, it, it, it can work. There are obvious, there are obvious ways that it can work and I see it working for a lot of people. So we may require some creativity. It may require some things that, 
you know, maybe you never thought you would be doing, but uh, I would uh, I would wholeheartedly encourage anybody with a passion um, to, to go ahead and pursue it. And I would say that applies to the fly fishing space as well. Mm-hmm. All of them, I would agree. Yeah, that's well said. Yep. And if people want to follow up with you, what's the best way to get in touch? <laughs> Through your website? Yeah, well, I don't mind giving out my business email. It's okay. mbale, mbale, that's bale like a bale of hay, Mark. So it's mbale at farbank.com. Um, um, I may not answer back immediately, so don't get upset if you don't hear right away, but I am pretty good about getting back to people. Great, cool. We'll link to that in the show notes too. Well, it's been great catching up, Mark. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Rick. The ferry's just leaving the dock, so uh, my day officially begins. Good so, timing. Uh, well, have a great day. All right. All right. See you later. later. Bye-bye. Bye now. If you want more of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com where you find all the episodes, show notes, and much, much more. Until next time, be sure to make time to get outside.